Great are you, Lord, and worthy of praise. We come before you this morning to praise you, to consider your attributes, to look on your goodness, and to praise your character. We thank you that we can gather together with our brothers and sisters to honor you, to study your word, to encourage each other to continue following you. This morning, we want to praise you for who you are. And in particular, this morning, we want to praise you, Father God, for your gentleness. Your word tells us that you lead your people like a shepherd leads a flock of sheep. You gather the lambs in your arm. You carry them in your bosom, and you gently lead those that are with young. All through the scriptures, we can see instances where you were gentle with your people, God. You were gentle with them when they deserved judgment. You were gentle with them when they continued to rebel. You were gentle with them even though they went after false gods. You, God, are gentle, and we praise you for being a gentle God with us. You continue in your gentleness by welcoming sinners into your presence. And this is such a gift for us. Jesus tells us, he says, Come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. We thank you, Father that you are gentle to welcome sinners into your presence when we run to Jesus with our sin. We take our sin to you and we say, Father God, this is what we have done. Forgive us. And you are gentle and welcoming. Your heart leaps with joy to welcome us into your presence when we come to you. You are gentle with us by laying down your life for your church that we would be able to come into your presence, and to have and experience forgiveness. We praise you, Father, for being gentle. And yet when we consider who you are, we also confess that often, and especially we can even look in this past week and see and confess that we have often not been gentle like you are. You call us to pursue gentleness. You give us the fruit of the Spirit that we might be gentle and yet so often, we are not gentle with those around us. We are not gentle with our words in the way that we communicate with those we love and those we work with. We are not gentle in our actions, harming others with our actions and physically. We are not gentle with our attitudes and our attitudes towards others and our thoughts for them. We are not gentle in our thoughts we pray that you would forgive us for not being gentle, not being like you. You call us in your word to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy towards all people. And yet so often we can see that this, these verses, this, these commands that you have given to us are lacking in our lives. We pray that, we would, that you would forgive us for our sin of not being gentle, for not following after you, for not even desiring to follow you in being gentle, but seeking to fulfill ourselves by being strong-willed, by being harsh, by being unloving toward those around us that we might build our own kingdoms instead of seeking to build yours. For these sins and more, we ask that you would forgive us. But we also give you thanks that you are gentle and forgiving and that all that would come to you in repentance of sin in the name of Christ Jesus, you are ready and willing to forgive us of sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you for being gentle with your children through Jesus Christ. We thank you also this morning for the blessing of Christian community.
that we can encourage each other with our words and our deeds. We can warn each other. We can watch out for each other. We can encourage each other to follow Christ in all of life. We thank you for this blessedness that we get to experience this morning, gathering together as your bride. We ask that as we go out this week, that we would also engage in Christian community, encouraging each other as we meet throughout the week, that we would read scripture together, that we would pray together, that we would take advantage of this gift that you have given us of Christian community, brothers and sisters in Christ, that can encourage us in our love and obedience to you. We thank you for these good gifts that you give us. We also pray that as you call us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that we have been called with all humility and gentleness and with patience, bearing with one another in love, we ask that you would build us up in that, that as Grace Church in Amsterdam, that we would walk worthy of the calling to which we have been called. We pray that we would be good neighbors to the neighbors on our street and in our neighborhoods, that we would show the love and care and compassion and gentleness of Christ with those we interact with in our neighborhoods. We pray that we would work for the good of the city in our workplaces and in our neighborhoods, that we would be faithful in praying for those who rule over us and govern the city and the country. We also pray for the service this morning as we gather together to hear your word preached, to proclaim your name, to respond in worship through the Lord's Supper, through singing praises of response, through prayers, through the reading of scripture. May all that we do this morning give glory to you, for you are above and over all, and you deserve all the honor and glory and praise. We thank you for being able to come to worship you together this morning. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. At this point, Tuscany will come to read for us the psalm for this morning. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him, strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in faithfulness. Well, good morning, Grace Church. So great to be with you today. Please uh, pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to ask you a question. Would you rather sing a new song or an old song? 
the advantage, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what's uh, exactly what's in store after, the, after I speak. Will the worship team lead us in an old song or new song or one of each, both? The, that's great. That's perfect. So the advantage of an old song is that it's familiar, right? We're comfortable with it, and so it's easy for us to sing. However, because it's so familiar with us, you know, to us, sometimes we can just be on autopilot while we're singing, right? Not really thinking about the meaning of the words. However, if we are concentrating, focusing on the meaning of the words, singing an old song can be a rich experience, uh, bringing to the surface memories, feelings, beliefs uh, that are important to who we are. Singing a new song can be harder work. We've got to quickly learn new words along with melody, rhythm, timing of the song. But this challenge can be fun. Singing a new song can give us a fresh experience, new ideas. Or it can communicate good old ideas in a fresh way. Psalm 96 begins with the invitation, O sing to the Lord a new song. I don't think this means that old songs are not allowed. When this song was written, yeah, it was a new song, but now it's 3,000 years old. Yet it still has a lot of meaning and value for us today. I think that the call to sing a new song doesn't mean we always have to sing only new songs, but it means renew our singing. Whether we sing old songs or new songs, we should refresh and revive our praise to God. We should meditate on the meaning of the words that we sing and open our hearts to be drawn closer to God through his spirit. We can renew our praise because God is always sending us new blessings. As it says in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Well, what is Psalm 96, this old new song, all about? I would sum it up in one sentence. It is our duty and privilege to invite people of all nations to worship God, because God is worthy of worship, and he's coming to rule and judge the world. Now, when I read a passage of scripture, it helps me to understand it if I can break it up, uh, make an outline of it. And I would say that we can break up Psalm 96 into, uh, into four parts, four sections. Each section is about three verses long. So the first section is verses one through three. And this section tells us that we're called to tell people of all nations about God's greatness. So we need to sing loud enough so that people can hear. In verse three, it says, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. You know, a a misunderstanding that people could have, and I think it's a a misunderstanding that people do have about the Bible, is that in the Old Testament, God is only concerned with the Israelites or with the Jewish people. But then in the New Testament, he begins to uh, show some care and concern for people in the rest of the world. However, uh, the, the fact is that God shows his care and concern for people of all nations throughout the Old Testament. Let me give you a few examples. In Genesis chapter 12, when God calls Abraham, he says, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed, meaning all the nations. Later, God chooses Ruth, a woman from Moab, a country that is often at war with Israel, to be the grandmother of King David, uh, Israel's greatest king. When Ruth moves moves to Bethlehem in the land of Israel, she tells her Israelite mother-in-law, where you go, I will go. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. When King Solomon dedicates the temple that he has built for God, he prays that the Lord will hear and answer the prayers of any foreigner who would come and pray at the temple. Uh, Solomon says, in order that all peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you. Later, when the prophet Jonah goes to Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire, by the way, that's in Iraq today, he preaches a harsh message of judgment from the Lord. The people of Nineveh respond by fasting, praying, repenting, and pleading with God for mercy. 
Jonah is later disappointed, but not surprised, when God forgives and decides not to destroy these enemies of Israel. <clears throat> Jonah actually complains to God, I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from sending disaster. Darn it. Finally, the prophet Isaiah speaks about a person called the servant of the Lord, to whom God says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. I believe that Grace Church has great potential to declare God's glory to the nations because we are a church made up of people from many nations. So let me take a survey right now. How many of you were born in Asia? Raise your hands. Great. And how many of you were born in Africa? Yeah. How many of you were born here in Europe? Yeah, quite a few. And uh, how many were born in Australia or one of the Pacific Islands? No one, but maybe at home. <laughs> and uh, how many were born in South America? Yes, I see someone in the back. Fantastic. How many were born in North America? Great. And was anyone uh, born someplace else that I haven't mentioned? <laughs> Since we're a church composed of people from many nations, we have a special capacity and opportunity to reach out to people from many nations who are here, expats from other countries, including people from the same countries as we ourselves. You know, a lot of people would never consider visiting a church in their home country, um, but they become more open when they're expats of another country. Years ago, I was a missionary in China, and I met many uh, university students in China who would say something like this. Maybe in the future, uh, I will go to the, a Western country to study, and then maybe I'll become a Christian. Uh, but right now, living in China, I could not consider it. When people are expatriates living far from home, they get disconnected from the traditions and social obligations that may prevent them from going to church or pursuing a relationship with God. Now that they're far from home, they may be more free, more open to new ideas, as well as feeling a new sense of needing community. If we take the initiative, uh, well, let's keep our eyes open to people from many nations who are around us here in Amsterdam. If we take the initiative, we may find that they would be uh, receptive to conversation about the gospel or to coming to church. Okay, the second section of Psalm 96 in verses 4 through 6 give us reasons why we should praise and proclaim God to the nations. These reasons include that God is great, that he's worthy of praise, that he's greater than all the other so-called gods, that he's the creator of the whole universe that he's perfect in his attributes of strength, beauty, splendor, and majesty. Now, all of these things could be summed up simply by saying, we praise and proclaim God because he is awesome. Now, I realize that awesome is a word that has lost its value in modern times. It, it used to be a $100 word, now it's a $2 word. The original meaning of awesome is inspiring awe, uh, wonder or amazement. But today we often use this word casually, don't we? We could refer to a day at the beach, a movie, or a lecker dessert as awesome. However, in my own conversation and speech, I would like to try to restore the meaning of this word. I'd like to try limiting awesome to just referring to God, the one and only person who is truly awesome. God is ultimately and supremely awesome because of the greatness of who he is and the amazing things that he's done, including um, his actions of creating the universe and saving his people uh, throughout history, but especially supremely in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
In verse 5 of our psalm, the psalmist makes a sharp distinction between the one true God and other things that people wrongly consider to be awesome. He says, For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. In the original Hebrew, there is a kind of pun, an interesting play on words in this verse. The Hebrew word for gods is Elohim, and the word for worthless idols is Elilim. Uh, you can see these are uh, words that sound similar, but they have greatly different meanings. The psalmist brings these similar-sounding words together to make his point. The nation's Elohim are actually Elilim. That is, the things that many people uh, consider to be gods are actually worthless. Something that surprised me after moving to the Netherlands is seeing how many people have statues of Buddha in their front gardens. I wonder if you've noticed that. I don't think I've seen so many Buddhas in any other country except for Thailand in Southeast Asia. Now, I'm not sure what these Buddha statues mean uh, to people who have them in their gardens. Perhaps a variety of things. Maybe um, some people worship Buddha as a god. Maybe some people regard these statues as, uh, as good luck charms. Maybe some view them as symbols of peace and serenity. And perhaps some people just regard these statues as works of art. Uh, but we should remember that uh, in the world today, there are 470 million Buddhists who consider the statue of Buddha as a sacred object, something to worship or to focus on as a means of uh, getting spiritual enlightenment or maybe material blessings. There is a big difference between Buddhism and Christianity. So if you're a Christian, I'd like to encourage you, please don't keep a statue of Buddha or some other object from, a relig from another religion in your garden or your house. Uh, you might think it's just a work of art, but it could create confusion uh, in the minds of others about what you worship and what you value. One God, our God, made the heavens, so idols that represent other gods are worthless. Just as we shouldn't keep um, idols in our gardens or in our house, we shouldn't keep idols in our hearts. Idols of the heart may not be statues, but they may be a preoccupation with money, power, success, or popularity. How many likes did I get in social media today? An idol could be anything that takes our focus off the one true God. If we desire to pursue our own glory or satisfaction more than we want to declare God's glory, we're idol worshipers. Because there are so many things in the world that can draw our hearts away from God, the Apostle John concluded his first letter with this warning, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Because the God who created the universe is truly and uniquely awesome, the third section of our psalm, verses 7 through 9, states that all the nations of the world are invited to worship God. The psalmist calls on the people of all nations to praise God for his attributes of glory, strength, splendor, and holiness. He tells the nations to tremble before God in awe, and he even invites them to come into the temple of Israel's God and offer a sacrifice there. This agrees with Solomon's prayer that people of other nations would come to Jerusalem and worship the Lord. The animal sacrifices that took place in Jerusalem's temple were all symbols that uh, pointed, pointed ahead to the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus Christ would offer when he died for us on the cross. Jesus' death made possible complete forgiveness of sins for everyone who believes in him. Jesus paid our debt, and there's nothing else that we can do or need to do to be forgiven and accepted by God. That is an essential, important truth. At the same time, we can still bring offerings to God to demonstrate our love and gratitude for him. Three main categories of offerings that we can give to God are the three T's, our time, our talent, and our treasure. Something you can do for someone else can also be an offering to God. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 
as you did it for one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it for me. What would you like to offer God in the coming week? So let's me, let me summarize where we've been so far. The first section of Psalm 96 tells us that we're called to be people, I'm sorry, we're called to tell people of all nations about God's greatness. Uh, then it goes on in the second section, uh, he explains the reason why we should proclaim God, because he is awesome. And the third section tells us um, the nations, uh, well, in the third section, the psalmist directly addresses the nations of the world and invites them to come and worship the one true God. Then in the fourth section, the final section of the psalm, this is verses 10 through 13, the writer declares that the whole world should celebrate because God is bringing in his rule and justice. As the psalm reaches its crescendo, the writer calls on not only all peoples of the word the world to worship God, but also all of creation. He calls on the sky, the earth, the oceans, the fields, and the trees to worship God. He also calls on everything that is in the fields and everything that is in the oceans to uh, praise the Lord. This would seem to include creatures such as cows, sheep, deer, earthworms, fish, sharks, and whales to join the chorus of praising God. Now, this might raise a somewhat obvious question. How can the forces of nature or animals with limited intelligence sing praises to God? Do they even know anything about God? I'm reminded of a, a YouTube video I, I saw one time where a, um, someone had trained their dog to, uh, to pray before eating. So the dog had its hands folded, its head bowed, and the owner was speaking a prayer. And then when she said, Amen, the dog got up and, and ate his dinner. Well, the prayer happened to be in Korean. I don't think the, the dog understood that prayer any more than I did. But it understood that the Amen was, now I can eat. Well, I think we, sh so, so I think we should remember that Psalms are poetry. Not everything in them is meant to be taken literally. Second, God's creation praises God when it does what God created it to do. So when fish swim, when birds fly, when the leaves on a tree transform uh, the sun's energy into uh, uh, energy that it can use through the process of photosynthesis, it's, these things are praising God. They're glorifying God because they're doing what God created them to do. Third, the natural world testifies to the existence and greatness of the God who created it, just by existing. As the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. Creation reveals God and reveals his glory. If we're thinking rightly, the sight of a night sky fills with, uh, filled with stars or the waves of the sea crashing against the beach will lead us to praise the awesome creator who made these things. The psalmist tells us that the God who created the world is also its king and judge. In verse 10, he says, Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Now, this phrase, the Lord reigns, could, often, uh, could also be interpreted, the Lord is king. Later in the same verse, he adds, he will judge the peoples with equity. Then in verse 13, he says that the Lord comes to judge the earth. So, God is both a king who reigns and a judge. The idea that, uh, that one person could be both a king and a judge runs counter to um, our modern democratic systems, but it was normal in biblical times. Deciding legal cases was part of the job description of the kings of Israel. An example is the well-known story of King Solomon, uh, who had two women come to him for judgment because they were disputing about who is the mother of this baby that both of them claimed. Today, many people dislike the idea uh, that God could be judge. Well, uh, 
we often just dislike the idea that anyone could be judged, right? We don't like judgmentalism. The idea of, of a judge can suggest a person who imposes arbitrary rules and standards that limit other people's freedom. Of course, most people believe that justice is a good thing. But can you have justice without a judge? I don't think so. Recently, my daughter and I were in a traffic accident. Fortunately, it was a fender bender. No one was hurt. The police officer, officer who came to this scene determined that uh, the other driver, not us, the other driver was at fault. Naturally, I appreciated her judgment. More significantly, though, we live in a world that has a lot of injustice. Rich and powerful people claim special privileges for themselves and unfairly take advantage of the poor and the weak. Horrible crimes against humanity are committed in war. A lot of this injustice is never uh, punished in this life. People just seem to get away with it. So it's a message of comfort and hope when Psalm 96 concludes with the promise that the Lord comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. The promise that God would come into this world as king and judge began to be fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ. He was the word who became flesh and dwelt among us, having glory as the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth, as it says in John 1. When Jesus began to preach, he declared, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus challenged injustice in both its demonic and human forms. When engaged in a debate about his ministry of freeing people who were oppressed by demons, Jesus said, If it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. He went on to compare Satan to a strong man and himself, Jesus, to someone who had come to tie up the strong man uh, and uh, then begin robbing his house, taking away the people that were under his authority and bondage. As for human injustice, Jesus attacked the hypocrisy of some of the religious leaders of his day. Uh, he said they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move a finger, uh, th those burdens. When Jesus died on the cross, he gave his life as a ransom for many. He satisfied God's justice against sin by suffering as a substitute for all of us, experiencing the wrath and punishment that we all deserve. When Jesus rose from the dead three days later, he guaranteed that all who believe in him would receive God's forgiveness and share the eternal life that he had won for us by defeating death. Jesus later ascended to heaven after having promised his followers that one day he would return and bring in God's kingdom in all its fullness. So today we are living in the in-between time, between the first coming and the second coming of Christ. The promise of Psalm 96 has already been partly fulfilled. Our King Jesus has come, and he has inaugurated God's reign of justice. Yet there is still a lot of injustice and sin in the world. We're waiting for the return of Christ when his kingdom will be completely and perfectly established. And evil and justice will be evil and injustice will be totally removed and done away with. In this time of waiting, we can wait with hope and joy. Christ has already come and inaugurated his kingdom of justice. So we can be confident that he will fulfill his promise. He will come again uh, to perfectly uh, establish it. In this in-between time, God's kingdom is continually growing and expanding as we, his people, empowered by his spirit, declare his glory among the nations. Let's repeat the main idea of Psalm 96. It is our duty and our privilege to invite people of all nations to worship God because God is worthy of worship and he is coming to rule and judge. How could God use us to declare his glory among the nations in the coming week. 
Maybe you could do an act of kindness that would allow Christ's love to shine through you. Maybe you could give a special donation to Grace Church, a Christian charity, or a missionary. Maybe you could invite a neighbor to come to church with you. Maybe you could initiate a conversation about spiritual things with a coworker. Maybe you could share with a friend a story about how God answered one of your prayers. There are many ways to declare God's glory. God's kingdom is growing and spreading in the world, and he delights to use us to help accomplish that goal. I'd like to ask Adam to come and lead us in prayer now. Can you all hear me? Thanks. Um, Father, we uh, thank you for your, Rob's message and for uh, your righteousness and faithfulness. Um, we thank you that as you judge uh, the earth, that we are clothed in righteousness through Christ. Um, even as we fail and in our sin, um, that, that you came and died and, and clothed us with righteousness. So, Father, I do um, just pray for, for us in this room and online. Um, that we would find ways this week, as Rob um, challenged us, to, to share and declare your glory among the nations here in Amsterdam. Um, and now, Lord, as we uh, prepare to worship, just pray that we would uh, renew our, uh, our song to you, as Rob said, and that we would join with the psalmist and with creation um, and with each other uh, in, in bringing worship and glory to your name. Uh, it's through Christ and in Christ we pray. Amen. we transition now, uh, we're going to take time to spend some time together worshiping through communion and also through singing. Uh, To open us in communion, I want to start by reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So that's what we're doing here today. Uh, I love the picture that Rob gave us, this posture that I want us to take on today as as we celebrate communion of remembering and also waiting. So Paul tells us that, that when we take communion together as believers, as a church, this is a remembrance. This is a remembrance of the gospel. This is a symbol that we partake in that tells us about the death, the perfect life, the death, and the resurrection, and the reconciliation and hope that we have in Jesus. At the same time, we also can look ahead as we wait. And we know, he, Paul said we do this as often as we take it, until the Lord returns. So one day, we won't need symbols. One day, we won't need a picture of the gospel because we will have his presence fully. He will come. His kingdom will be fully made, both in our lives and in our world. So that I want to take that posture today. I want to take time as believers to remember the sacrifice of Jesus, but also to wait and to expect and to hope in his future coming. So As we get started, I'm going to invite our musicians and our worship team to come first. And as you're ready, Christian, after that, I want you to come. I'm going to take some bread, dip it in the cup, and put it on the plate. You can take it back to your seat. Take some time to meditate on these truths that Rob has showed us today. And when you're ready, you can partake. And then after everyone who's had a chance that wants to has taken communion, then we will take time to worship together through singing. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get started with communion. God, thank you for the goodness of your word. 
Thank you for um, the Psalms where we can see your heart for your people. And as, as Dr. Rob said, we can see that your heart for your people is your heart for all nations. That you desire worship from the people of Israel. You desire worship from the people of the Netherlands, from the people of every nation. God, we celebrate and we thank you for that. God, thank you that you have chosen us. Thank you for the people of Grace Church. Thank you that we can worship and celebrate your life. You're taking on our sin, our punishment on the cross and your death and your resurrection, defeating death on our behalf. God, and thank you for the gift of Jesus that we can have your righteousness. So I pray today that as we celebrate that together in communion and through worship and singing, God, that you would continue to make us look more like you and that you would be pleased by the worship that we offer. In your name we pray, amen. So I'm gonna first invite our media and worship team up. Christian, as you're ready, you can come to the table.
And when we are calling the nations to worship his holy name, how will we call them? What will we say? This is a new song. So I'm going to teach it to you guys by singing the first verse, and then we'll sing it again together. That sound all right? This is Come Ye Sinners. It goes like this. Our benediction passage for today comes from Romans 16, verses 25 to 27. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed through the prophetic writings, has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God, 
to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. We hope to see you again really soon.